This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. You know, Dave, it's time for the kids to go back to school where they can learn and grow. It's a great opportunity for them. But as adults, we lose that curiosity, or at least we think we do. You're right, Greg. For once in your life, (laughs) having a goal to take steps towards is a key component to all of our mental health, and BetterHelp can provide that opportunity to us. A chance to engage, create goals that are meaningful to us, and accomplish them. Or... Maybe you just want to talk to someone that gets you. And that could be a possibility, right? Sure. And with BetterHelp, they make that easy by aligning you with a therapist who really understands you. Imagine. Mm. This is so important. And the fact that BetterHelp actually allows you to switch therapists at any time, if it's not a good fit, is such a key component to this. Unheard of, really. So if you're thinking about starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. Rediscover your curiosity with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash nothing today to get 10% off your first month. My curiosity is peaking, Greg. Mm-hmm. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash nothing. That's right. Today. <laughs> today. Do it. Do it now. <laughs> Hey everybody, welcome to the Unconventional Therapist Guide to Nothing. My name is Dave. I'm all jazzed up today. Jazzed. Get it? Not bad, it. dude. Yeah. That's, that's not right. bad. Hey, hey, that that uh that awesome voice right there was the uh under the weather Greg. Mm. So you're gonna the dulcet tones of potential dulcet. COVID. They'll say tones. <laughs> yes. That sounded fancier. It's a little, you know, you could hear this and maybe uh like a raspy jazz club. Maybe I've been in a smoking all night and having a good old time, right? Eating some beignets and gumbo. Smoking ganja. That's right. Well, okay. Well, I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> I thought that's what you were saying. <laughs> well, I was just thinking of I was thinking of things that Oh, you meant cigarettes. Yeah. Yeah. Like invoke New Orleans to me. And I don't know if those things, any of those. So like Katrina, I don't know. Somehow that always comes up. Creole, Cajun, jazz, like you mentioned. And well. Pitbulls and paroles. <laughs> that's right. Absolutely. Um, Thomas Jefferson and Napoleon, the Louisiana Purchase. That's what everyone, sure. that's what everyone thinks of. Um, no, I, we're thinking uh, voodoo would probably be one of the things that ghosts, right? New Orleans is associated with. I oh, think. yeah. Yep. And, you know, voodoo, and I won't get too much into this, but this this thing that evolves from a blend of different cultures, maybe a way to hide religion from an intolerant oppressor. I'm not stealing your thunder on that because we covered it in hoodoo, but the people that, you know, would be interested in that. But mm-hmm. I, I really think that's interesting, like, because when I'm thinking of gumbo, it's this like, I don't know, almost like thick soup, right? I've had it. It's great. But it's not like the, it, not unlike the city itself or the religion and voodoo it's like the ingredients all kind of keep their original flavor they don't mix too much together but they are all these different things in one thing and i think that's such a great like metaphor for what new orleans is right it's like this melting pot but nothing really it doesn't assimilate the way the rest of the world does it stays very european it stays very caribbean it's it keeps all these components very separately but together and i think that's really cool you also it, forgot about uh, Gator Nuggets. Listen, I've had, listen. We there used to be this place called AJ Gators. Maybe it still exists. But when I was in the South, I had Gator Nuggets. I had them too. They're okay. Fishy chicken nuggets. F- oh, they were a little chewier. Yeah, not as good. I would just say not as They're good right. chicken nuggets. But it was depends cool to you, say you're eating. Gators. Yeah, it depends where you go. I'm not, I'm not gonna lie. I'm a big fan of um. Oh, what's this? Uh, I just had it in my head. Now I can't think of it. The sandwich. That they're po boy, po boys. I love po boys. Mm. I get a I get a po boy whenever I see it on the menu. I well, I I um, when I was in the navy, I had a bunch of friends who were kind of from this area, and I went out there with them, and we we went crawdadding. We also went frog gigging, which is crawdaddy. Kind of... Wasn't that your nickname in high school? <laughs> yeah. Yep. Crawdaddy. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> you know what's what one more thing I, I wanted to mention about because we're gonna talk about 
Marie Laveau. We're going to talk about voodoo. But what's different about one thing that's different about the voodoo here and only in terms of Marie Laveau is that when the slaves had across the ocean, they relied on a spirit, um, Ada Wido, and this spirit kind of helped them cross the ocean. So women, it wasn't like that back in Haiti and West Africa. Well, I should say West Africa before Haiti, because you did have to cross the ocean. But anyways, in, in Africa, when you practice voodoo, it was more like this male-dominant patriarchy kind of thing, like the, our religion here was. Um, but with that sp female spirit helping cross the ocean, it became a prom predominantly female-centered um like where the female would le lead the religious rights like 75 percent of the time which i think is really fascinating but we'll get into that but so before we get into miss marie laveau which quite an interesting figure let's let dave tell us a little bit about new orleans and its link to this sure religion um, i was also gonna say when i was younger um i <laughs> okay. didn't really care for voodoo stuff no one cares. Well, no, you, it, no, I like, I like, it. it's kind of cool. Yeah. It's, it's, awesome. it's, it's cool. Um, but before I always associate it with, uh, Steven Seagal's marked for death. I don't know if you remember that, that movie. I do. There are some voodoo scenes in there and Absolutely. I was always like, I hated that part. So I always associate it. Then I just looked it up now and as actually, uh, that wasn't even in New Orleans. I was in Chicago, the movie. A lot of voodoo in Chicago, huh? I guess, I guess in Steven Seagal's Chicago, there is. All I right. mean, I, the one thing I would think about when I was a kid is like, you know, whenever you see this in pop culture or whatever, chicken though, bones. Like, yeah, you see chicken bones. You see, like, oh, like, like we'll get into that because I think that's an imp super important element of it. Like these, you know, elaborate, bizarre sort of combinations of spells and things like that. I think that's very purposeful. But just like when you're, say, you're like a, a staunch, like a, a religious Protestant family. And you're in there and you're you're in church or maybe you're at home and you're trying to go to bed and off in the distance through the Spanish moss hanging from these trees and into the woods, you hear like, you know, rhythmic music, you hear the beating of drums, you hear like screaming, you hear trances, you hear dance. I mean, that had to creep you out, right? Mm, yeah. But it's also awesome, right? At the same time. It's just something that's it's it's so cool, um, so misunderstood. Um, it's almost like in our DNA to kind of not like be, have an aversion to this sort of thing because it's like the unknown. But I think the more you kind of it's it falls in the same vein as Wicca and all these things where it's kind of connected to spirituality, like nature, yeah. or whatever. Um, but go ahead. So, but... so yeah, Louisiana voodoo or New Orleans voodoo, however you want to frame it, um, basically arose from the process of um taking a mix mash of different traditional religions, uh, specifically West Africa, uh, Roman Catholic, uh, form of Christianity and Haitian voodoo and kind of blending those all together. Um, so during the transatlantic slave trade, um, it played that played a pivotal role in the spread of voodoo because enslaved Africans brought their religious beliefs and practices uh, with them to the Caribbean and then the Americas. And in the Caribbean, partially, particularly in Haiti, um, that's when these beliefs evolved into Haitian voodoo, um, which incorporated already Catholicism due to the influence of French colonization. Um, this allowed enslaved Africans to continue practicing their religion covertly, often disguising their deities as Catholic saints. Um, so yeah, they, they continued to practice despite Catholicism and Christianity kind of dictating that they, they could not. Um, they just had to kind of keep it undercover. Now, Dave, is it the sort of thing where, like, so say they're say they're slaves, right? Yeah. And they're you know they're they're slaves of the French, or they're I'm not going to just say it. They actually were though. Yeah. So okay, and, and like Spain had control of this area at one time. The fr France had control of this area at one time. Are they on some level saying like, let's incorporate some of their gods too, because their gods seem to have some kind of strength or power too or is it just to sort of disguise their own religion and say like no no don't look over here we're doing your well your I, I think at some point it does kind of do that um and and that's a little bit later from what i understand so um this is like 18th century that might be more 19th century uh voodoo okay. um so uh with european colonization and haitian revolution of the end of the 18th century uh, slaves from many different tribes came to be very large presence in New Orleans, and voodoo traveled to New Orleans by the traditions carried um, 
by the West African and Haitian slaves. So they, you know, continue to practice as they made their way there. Can you imagine New Orleans at this time? Just like this place where there's like so much like, well, first of all, must the conditions must have been horrendous. I mean, it's like this just this dropping point for for slaves at this point. I, I can only yeah, imagine not only what that, it must have like, like looked like. Also, like where it is, the sea level, the disease, the the water table was so yeah. high. I, like mosquitoes. I don't, I've been dealing with a lot of mosquitoes lately around here, and it's it. I mean, I can imagine like you know the, you know this the, that was a problem. That had to have been a huge problem, right? Like disease and everything. So I mean, sure. yeah, no. And plus, I don't know. Yeah, it's it's on one hand difficult, and on the other hand, like there must have been all these like different people's kind of like converging in one area. Is well, that, that thought was just coming into my mind too, because it's like the one thing is um, I think back to when we did the episode on the Hmong and, you know, they're being, you know, those refugees are kind of being transplanted into this place where they're totally disconnected. And I mean, I guess the, on one aspect, like the part that they're at least coming together and they are holding on to these traditions. This is like what we talked about when we talked about Udu before. Um, holding on to some level of who you are, your roots. Um, yeah. That's that's important, right? That's your that's your culture. So they, at least they're able to keep some of their identity, even if they're sort of doing it under wraps. Uh, but that they un basically, I guess, what I'm saying is they understand the importance of that, and I think that's so valuable for them. And that's probably a big part of why they were able to succeed and as far as like staying established and um not losing their entire culture yeah and like you know when you're in, when you're you know slavery is her, her insidious in so many different ways but you're being pulled away from your family members so this is this like common sort of knowledge and religion is a way for them to still feel connected and there's the strength in that you know i think that's pretty interesting you know it it's it's nostalgic for home it gives you some meaning like we're still you know we're still connected to who we are i think that's cool yeah yeah and so you know they're bringing their their voodoo religion with them um but the practice starts to become really influenced uh through the colonization and the slave trade so that now it's um you have the presence of french spanish and creoles in new orleans and um, if you asked me to define Creole, I heard a definition recently and I was like, I still don't understand completely. It's kind of a mix mash of some things. I understand that aspect to it. I don't know, Greg, mm. you have a better definition. No, you know, it's funny is I, I did run into that today and I, I, I don't, I've heard very simplified definitions and I've heard yeah. very complex definitions. And I, I know it, there's like a wide variety of what Creole could even like encompass. So it's, it's kind of. I know there's some French influence, but also some Haitian. I, I'm not going to say it. And like, yes, yeah, so I don't want to touch it either because it's like and then Cajun. And then sometimes yeah. like, is, is that just food? Not really. That's like sort of an idea. Like I, that that whole thing. That's not what the episode's about, but that's interesting, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's an episode on itself, I guess. Yeah. Um, so there's at this point, there's like several variations of voodoo, which is kind of interesting, too. Um so, for example, some West African slaves forced to adopt Catholicism from the uh, European colonists. Uh, they had their Haitian voodoo, and it was forced to disguise um, their voodoo saints or their uh, loa. I hope I'm saying that right. It might not be uh, with Catholic saint names. So they, Greg, like you said, um, or you were asking, I don't know necessarily that they used the Catholic saints and their those like in those roles that they were in, or if they just used the names to kind of disguise the ones that they already had. I think that's what, what's I ironic is they have very similar, often they have very similar like functions. Like yeah. for example, like Papa Legba, which we've talked about in the past is the gatekeeper between the spirit realm and the earthly realm. And that's interchangeable with St. Peter, who is at the, the, the gates of heaven. So, yes. I mean, they, they do have these like interesting, you know, even with like spells, I remember one spell is is like, um, you know, if you you want someone to love you or if you need something to like come back to you, you like bury a Saint Anthony upside down, and it's like I don't know, it's like is it is it like a um a perversion of the saints or is it reverence for the saints? Did you did you say the word Dembala? Is that what you said? Did you say no. that? All right, so Dembala is the one you're kind of referring to. So that's the serpent god who represents fertility, wisdom, and creation. Mm -hmm. And he's the one who's often associated with St. Patrick. Okay, that's St. Patrick. Which you yeah. do see St. Patrick with like um, the serpents. Thanks. 
Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Uh, just because we're already talking about it, Baron uh, Sim- Simedi uh, is the low, uh, the low of death in the afterlife. He is depicted as a skeletal figure in a top hat and is associated with St. Expedite. That's so funny because you often do see that like skeleton, like I'm seeing a ton of skeleton figures now with top hats on. And I'm like, where did that even start? Is that just you pointing mm. to yourself? No, I was doing a little top hat, tip of the hat. Oh, I thought you were pointing to yourself. Like, <laughs> okay, all right. I, I did get the reference. Over. <laughs> um, and then there's Urzuli, uh, the lo- Loa of love, beauty, and femininity. She's often associated with the Virgin Mary and is known for her benevolence and compassion. Mm. So, I, you know, I, Greg, I don't think it's so much that they're taking the Catholic, the Catholic saints. I think there literally is similarities and they're utilizing those names to, like to maintain their deities. But yeah. I think there are commonalities between Absolutely. the two religions. When we were talking about, you know, Saturnalia and these like ancient holidays, yeah. you could t- you, they interchanged like, you know, the sun god that became Jesus, right? which is essentially right. the son of God, right? So like, that's what you're celebrating uh, on that that holiday. So it's it's interesting how like, you know, there's these gods and then whichever religion sort of is more powerful kind of absorbs that and mm-hmm. uses it. You know, I think it's interesting. So one thing that made everything challenging during this time in the 18th century was, um, they, you know, they were treated obviously really terrible in Louisiana. And um, the white men forbid the slaves from gathering for fear of... Uh, you know, uprising or something like that. Um, So that was challenging. But then with the Louisiana Purchase of 1803, um, when the Americans became the main authorities, uh, the voodooists were freer to practice as they wished. And in the early 19th century, many migrants also fleed, um, fleeing the Haitian Revolution arrived in Louisiana, bringing with them Haitian voodoo, um, which uh, contributed to the formation of the Louisiana voodoo. So um, again, more just... uh, you know, mixing of different cultures and different variations of, of voodoo. And the interesting thing with voodoo, is it, it's very loosely practiced. So there's no like specific rules or regulations or what form it could take. Um, so it's very like free flowing and um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like kind of self-regulated, it sounds like yeah. almost. Yeah. So it, like almost like it ha- it's different in it's like regional, you know? Like yeah, different areas yeah. practice different, or or even individualistic, right? So like you're going to get into Marie Laveau, but I'm sure like her form of voodoo that she would practice probably looked a lot different than other, um, you know, other big names in the, yeah. in the voodoo game at that time, you know. Um, so but I bet you part of, and I don't want to like interrupt, but like I bet you part of people's fear of the voodoo at this time is like Haiti's known for slave revolt after slave revolt after slave revolt, and. When the people, when the slaves are in New Orleans, they and they they're congregating in the woods and like they're having these you know all night long celebrations, they must be thinking, is that happening sure. again? You know, yeah. to be yeah. part of it. Yep. So in New Orleans, the practice became mainly focused on what they call grigris, or their mm. paraphernalia or novelties, and and voodoo queens, which you're going to get into in a little bit. Um, there was here tell of a scandalous orgies and rituals that took place among uh, New Orleans voodooists and came about with the rise of the voodoo queens. Um, there are tales of human sacrifices, massive orgies, bodies writhing unnaturally like snakes. A lot of hearsay, right? Yeah. A lot of, lot of which I mean, kind of, you know, makes sense when you're talking about the opinions that, you know, kind of started to form around the religion, the danger, it probably. Uh, people felt about it. Uh, but after the 1960s, New Orleans tourist industry, um, you know, kind of utilized voodoo to attract visitors. Um, so it's like a, a little bit of a voodoo revival was happening. Yeah. And um, yeah, it drew heavily on other African uh, dysphoric religions, such as Haitian voodoo and Cuban centuria. And yeah, I mean, and the interesting thing is also it's uh, biracial. So there are, um, there are white participants since at least the 19th century and even some contemporary voodoo groups that are majority white membership, that which is cool. fascinating. Yeah, that's very interesting. Uh, before you go into Marie Laveau, I was just going to talk about those the rituals. Um, yeah, all right. Uh, according to many local uh, locals living in New Orleans in the 19th century, there was a quintessential voodoo ritual that went on in secrecy. 
It took place late at night amongst the shores of the the bayou and um, always involved a voodoo queen and a Lee Grand zombie or a snake who they worshipped. Um, and it had this kind of agenda. So participants would gather around a fire and a python would be brought in a box to the queen. Uh, she would allow the snake to lick her face. And then from there, she would gain the power. And then the queen would then stand on the snake box and begin to shake and move. Um, she would touch or hold hands with the king and others to transfer her power. That was the ritual. That is very interesting. Like, you can imagine that, right? Like, there's always some kind of strange thing. Like, all right, now there's this, like, Marie Laveau had a, a big, huge black python named Zombie, yeah. ironically. And she would, you know, people thought that she would have conversations with it. And when she led these rituals, she would have, oh, it would always be something different. She'd, like, lay out a white sheet, and then she'd have, like, just random things. Like, you said, like, chicken bones, maybe, like, a, a hawk skull or, you know, like a... A dead frog or, or like you know three burnt matchsticks there was the the spirits always the the average payment for a spirit you know there was kind of a customary payment and it was always three nickels so like putting three nickels down it's just like this weird sort of it's seemingly innocuous you know recipes yeah that maybe did she just make up i don't know like i will talk or about and, and, you know, in some of this, it's like, you know, obviously it's hearsay. It's possibly just rumors. Who knows if this even has ever taken place ever. Um, yeah. A couple other other things. Uh, historical records um, talk about, like, deities that were worshipped in voodoo. So uh, prominent among them were Blanc, Dani, the Grand Zombie, and Papa Labat. Uh, these were... Um, venerated at altars where sacrifices were made to them altars are a big thing in voodoo yeah altars making altars you know um and then the other thing was spirits of the dead also played a prominent role in historical voodoo um accounts suggest in the 19th century that uh the saints played a prominent role although amid the 20th century revival um the veneration of deities from other african religions became more common and the uh, pr production of charms which are also known as the gregories play an important part so yeah, yeah, like um, you know, if you the Gregory's were very personal too. So it'd be like this little bag that you could wear around your neck and it's you know, maybe it's got some grave ash in it, or depending on what the spell is, she would, would put well, Marie would put something together and you wear that. And and you know, as you're talking about this, I'm thinking like, wow, this is the backdrop. So there's sort of the opposite of this, but it doesn't feel they feel opposite at all when I now that I'm thinking of it, like the Catholic religion, right? So it's like what you're describing a lot, you're describing altars, you're describing a lot of pageantry, you're describing a lot of ceremony, you're describing, you know, pomp and circumstance, and, you know, a leader and authority. And it's like, this kind of mirrors, like a, a Catholic sort of ceremony, doesn't it? Which makes sense how it's like has that, that connection, I guess, in a way. Yeah. Now, do you think that's that's that must be more of a New Orleans thing than in West Africa? Or is the does it look very different so like that would be different. the next question i would have about this that i i don't know so yeah. we would have to do some some more digging on voodoo itself yeah so i very very interesting and i'm happy to do some digging on it but you, it, don't you, do you know it was much. interesting though when we talked about this like because we wanted to do marie laveau at some point and um but then we was like oh well we should also probably just discuss first why new orleans is synonymous with voodoo because like i I don't know that you can think of New Orleans without thinking of certain dark aspects. And this makes mm -hmm. a lot of sense. But then it's like, all right, so I, I find this out. And now I'm like, yeah, now I want to know more about just voodoo itself. Yeah, like the origins. And, you know, we'll get into some maybe pop culture stuff where you can find out some of that's some of that. But it's just just the same way as like, I bet you the origins of Catholicism, the origins of Christianity look a hell of a lot different than what we're practicing today. Sure. So it's like, I, this is the evolution of voodoo. Is it important to know where it came from? I don't know, but it's interesting to yeah. find out, like sort of how it develops, like why three nickels make sense, why these certain, you know, these conjuring with these certain very particular, like does, like when we'll get into Maria Laveau, like does she really know all this stuff or is she really good at making this stuff up? And that's going to be, like when she talks about her greedy greedy bags and she talks about her potions, and um, she predicts the future and she tells people, gives people fortunes. And like, we're going to kind of get into 
how that was and what's interesting about that. So is it all right? Am I ready? Am I clear for takeoff? Yeah, let's do this. Let's hear about Marie right. Laveau. Marie Laveau. So the first kind, well, let's start to learn about Marie Laveau a little bit through this woman named Sunit Didi, because she, Marie wasn't the first voodoo queen in New Orleans. This woman actually was. And the leader after Sunit was a man named Dr. John who had over 50 children. Um, he kind of really kind of got into these greegree bags and the potions. And he was, Dr. John, so this is the evolution here a little bit in, in America, ironically, right? So there's Sunit Didi, who's very kind of traditionalist, maybe leaning a little bit more towards Haitian slash West African voodoo. And then there's this Dr. John, who's kind of, now it's America, he's a little bit more modern. They probably have differences of opinion. But Dr. John starts doing something interesting. He starts commoditizing it. Right, he starts charging for greenery bags and potions, and this man was the mentor of Marie Laveau, who took voodoo and made it something incredibly famous. Right, so she's born in either 1794 or 1801. No one really knows. Was her father was white and her mother was a slave, but her the father and the mother had an interesting relationship that was very particular to New Orleans, where she was kept like it was known that they were in a relationship, right. But like it, they couldn't really get married because it was it was illegal, right? Because she was a slave, um, which I I just find very interesting. And also in New Orleans, they don't like during in the rest of the South and even in the North at this time. We're talking about you know early eighteen hundreds. There's it's very binary, right? There's black and there's white. But the word colored, who I know like it's a you know now it's an awful word, but in this time it was sort of a progressive word where. New Orleans would see variations of color. It would be like, all right, so this person's like 75%. This person's half. That, that would be like mulatto. That would, that, would be, that would come from. But like, it was sort of interesting how they kind of differentiated it. It wasn't just black and white. There was like varying degrees. And I think that was kind of interesting, right? If, so, if someone tried saying, um, oh, I don't see color, they would have been really pissed, huh? Yeah. They would have been like, what's wrong with you? From Georgia? Yeah. What <laughs> yeah. is wrong with you? Yeah. Yeah, no, it's so interesting. So Marie's childhood is kind of a blank. We don't really get a lot from her childhood because she wasn't really like a, there would be no real reason to be tracking that, right? Um, she was, she, you know, she was the daughter. She was normal. Yeah, she was just normal, right? So she had a profession though. She was a hairdresser, ironically. Did you know this? Yes. Okay, Awesome. I think that's so cool because this thing is, this is so interesting. Can you think of a modern hairdresser today? So this allows her to create this like network of people, which would kind of inform her prediction and her fortune telling, right? So she would be cutting people's hair and be listening to people talk within the salon, quote unquote, I can't really picture it that way. But this is where she would start understanding like, oh my God, I have access to secrets here. And that's pretty cool, right? So she can talk to the people that she's getting secrets about and let them know the secrets. And then they're like, how the hell does this lady know about this whole thing that's going on with like my wealthy, white, well-connected friends, right? So she's starting to develop a reputation. And as she does, her first family just completely disappears. She had a husband and she had two kids and they're just gone off the, there's no real record of it. But like I was saying before, a lot of yellow fever, people just die constantly in 1800s, right? Like early 1800s, it's not that weird. She starts up a new relationship with, you know, a white man and they have 15 kids, not, I mean, maybe a few of them live. Um, and, you know, that'll, that'll come to play a little bit later on in her story. But at the time with, she's kind of growing this reputation She's talking to politicians. She's talking to the wealthy through like her connections through her salon, right? And so it becomes in fashion to kind of get a reading from Marie Laveau, but it's also kind of controversial because she's a voodoo practitioner. So what she starts doing is she she starts making the Virgin Mary a central figure figure in her work. So by doing that, she's kind of like, well, people are like a little more likely to see her because they're like, oh, she, she kind of like is into the Virgin Mary. So maybe she's a little, um, you know, into it makes this her other look more stuff inclusive. Too. Oh, absolutely. Right. So, but what she's really doing is like, she, she starts selling these Grigory bags and these love potions, but what she's doing, she's preying on people's fears. She's preying on their wants, what they want. She sold answers and love and revenge 
And in return, she was paid for cash, but not only cash. So like, say someone comes to her and tells them like, oh, this guy, I think my husband's cheating on me or whatever it is. She's just given Marie Laveau a secret. And it's almost like that's her trade. She trades in secrets. So people willingly divulge their deepest, darkest secrets. And now she has them to use them. And she's a genius marketer. So she starts kind of portraying herself as this person. She's, you know, she's all about the showmanship. She's all about, you know, when she gives you a, a reading, it's like, depending if it's, if it's like a dark reading, she's going to wear dark clothes, dark browns and have the black snake around. If it's a light reading, she's going to wear all white and she's going to be, it's, it's very sort of, she gets it. You know what I mean? She really does. Um, there's this one example she's she has that her, her reputation is growing and there's this man and he's convicted of a crime but he didn't do it and it's well allegedly but his father comes to marie for help and he says look my son it's not going well in court like he's going to um you know be executed for something that he didn't do so marie's like i'll pray for him so she puts three hot peppers in her mouth she goes to the catholic cathedral prays right with the peppers in her mouth giving her pain to god and she goes to the the courthouse puts the peppers underneath the the judge's chair where, you know, maybe the rest of the people can see, but the judge can certainly see the three peppers. And he also sees Marie Laveau, who has this like presence about her now. She has this aura, like people are really kind of, they know who she is now and they're impressed with her. They're afraid of her. They're in awe of her. So the judge is like, all right, um, she's sitting on the side of the, this guy who she wants to get out of trouble and he kind of knows her stance. So the guy gets off scot-free and this person um, gives Marie her house, which actually is not true, but that's the legend. And I think that's super cool because her whole sort of persona is built in legend, yeah. which I think is cool. So she essentially has this position as the hairdresser being in a role where you do learn to, trust your your barber or your hairdresser or Absolutely. whoever you learn to trust them because you know they listen to you and their whole job is based on not just cutting your hair or styling your hair but being personable while they're at it so they're mm -hmm. masters at this multitasking they're probably better than us greg like when it comes to like they are doing two things two trades at once yeah <laughs> at once or we're just doing one you know, it's funny. That's a, that's an that's an angle too. Like, you know, another thing as you're saying that, I'm thinking of were these was it racism that you know allowed her to kind of prey on these rich, you know, white. Well, there's a, an allure to this woman too, if you think yeah. about it that way. Because, like, yes, she's a different color. She's um, so maybe they already have these like notions about her and like what she's capable of because of their you know their idea that maybe she's into voodoo. But then she's also kind of trustworthy because she has like, mm. you know, the Virgin Mary. Um, maybe, there's so maybe many it starts, angles. Maybe this starts even worse than that. Like maybe, maybe they're like before anybody even knows what she's all about. Before she develops herself, she's just doing the hairdressing, and people are just acting as if she doesn't exist, as if she's not intelligent enough to kind of like really engage with their gossip or whatever. And she's kind of like a fly on the wall, and she's absorbing it all and like taking what she can use and, and calculating is super interesting too yeah uh, but she there's another time she gets real some real street cred when she um obviously yellow fever is a huge problem in louisiana um tons of water everywhere no one knows that you know how germs are spread and that it's you know it's through mosquitoes insects whatever however and marie's not afraid of people who are sick at Wait, all through mosquitoes and what oh, germs oh okay. is this a biology podcast <laughs> okay never mind why? What did you think I said? Through mosquitoes and sex. Oh, well, you know, maybe, sure, maybe. So when, but like, you know how like today, like it's so brave. I remember when, when COVID first came out, um, you know, I remember someone saying after the Spanish flu in World War One, people were more embarrassed about how they treated the sick than like, you know, the fear of the actual illness in the end, right? Like it was, it, they really felt bad about the way they treated people. You know, when like, remember when, and, and I felt guilty of it too. Like, you know, when you'd be at work and like, it, it's COVID, COVID's new and someone sneezes and you're like, oh my God, what, that's an assault, right? You're like, I got to get away. 
Um, Marie wasn't like that at all. She, people were, it was like epidemic level yellow fever and she was treating people. She was like giving them all these herbs and, and kind of caring for them with her voodoo. And ironically, her patients did much better than any of the patients treated with like modern medicine because modern medicine at this time is like not great, right? So like yeah, modern right. medicine is is killing people. And, you know, they're using mercury to to fight off these diseases and, you know, bloodletting and all these things. Of things. And she's using herbs and, and these sort of like natural things, which is really kind of giving people a, a chance. So I think that's interesting. So, so she's a powerful figure. How, how did she get the reputation that she got? So, I, I mean, just through time and honestly, the best marketing she's a, if if marie laveau is anything she's an incredibly brilliant marketing like at yeah. this time she just knew how to i mean the elaborate spells like the bury a chicken outside of this house and you'll find out if he's cheating on you um leave gifts of rum and coins for the spirits like the the i mean just these like the things that she would do the the um the ceremonies that she would put on, they would be so elaborate. And, and she just, it was just so interesting how she, it was so different from what people were used to and so sort of exotic that it's almost like she was one of a kind. So they were like very interested in it. Um, and she even I, did- this... Ironic that you said one of a kind. <laughs> are you talking about, are you talking about the, the possibility of two Marie Laveaux? Yeah. That's an awesome sort of immortality- story i wonder which what version you heard of that i heard that her daughter may mm. have taken her role yeah well that's essentially it but like if you if you think about the way they did that right where so you say say people aren't really too that much aware of marie laveau's daughter this adds to her mystique so here's this old woman she's getting older she's getting kind of gray and and then maybe she does some kind of spell and now she's back and maybe she's a little bit darker. So maybe she had to give a little bit of her soul because they said her daughter was a little bit more darker. Her da daughter is actually the one who had the black snake named Zombie who she would kiss and all these things. So it's like some people, a lot of people at the time are thinking like, oh my God, like did Marie Laveau like do a spell to regain her youth? Is this is this some kind of like immortality thing? And Or then other people are sort of thinking, but there's another Marie Laveau who's still alive. Are there two Maries? Like does she have a young version, an old version? And her and her daughter just played off this and i don't know if her like her mother sanctioned this or she was the heir to this name or whatever the plan was but there's so much you know like some stories are even like marie was swept into the ocean in her whole cottage and out came the young version of marie and like that's her daughter it's like all these awesome kind of like stories about it with that i love and it's, it's very wild. You know, the whole time we're talking about this, you know, it's really funny. I know we're not doing like pop culture yet, but like this was the inspiration for Miss Cleo. Really? I guess I could see that with the head. It had to be, right? It had to be. Call me now. I'm, I'm not going to do the accent. She, I think she's passed, right? Did she, she pass? Was, there was a documentary on that. Was there? Yeah, I have to watch that now because you know we're talking about like the showmanship. Like you would see the commercial mm -hmm. with Miss Cleo, and it was all about like, you know, just it was like showy. Like I think there was like stars in the behind her. She was like in space almost, and you know, just it had this aura to it that was like very, just exactly like what Mer it was showmanship, right? It was you know, and the, yeah. The thing is, it's it's interesting. And why did we we give so much credence to like this person? So she was just. Miss Cleo was just a normal city person, but like we give her the 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 headdress and the accent, and now we are thinking of her like out sort of like outside of society. Was her accent fake? Yes. Oh my god! So <laughs> she's out. She's outside of society, and now we we kind of trust her. Oh, she's got she's in touch with something a little bit deeper, a little bit more intense, a little bit outside of the norm, and we trust that. I wonder what that's about. But it's no different than, you know, those, um, the other, the other side of it, I'm trying to think what you would call those individuals, the mediums, the psychic mediums that mm -hmm. do it in an audience. There's someone over there who's like, knows someone who's passed away with the, with the letter J and then yep. someone's like, that's me. Yeah. And they're like, oh my God, how'd you know? That was you Poppy. Know, 
<laughs> you know what's funny, Dave? It's meant it's funny that you mentioned like the headscarf thing because that was actually forced upon African women. And women like um Marie Laveau were like, all right, you're gonna force me to wear this like headscarf thing to kind of identify me as less than. Well, we're they're gonna make like really elaborate, beautiful versions of it to the point where there's this famous picture of Dolly Madison wearing one because she thinks it's so beautiful. So they took this thing that was like an insult and made it something beautiful. And I think that's that's pretty great. Yeah. I have a I have I have a couple little um yeah go ahead little tidbits, just like quick little takeaways from this from this research. Throw us some gems. Okay, well, so first thing I wanted to mention was again like just the, it's such a great gothic scene when you think of. Marie Laveau in the woods and the drums and the chanting and, and like all that. I love that so much. I love that there's a song about Marie Laveau written in part by Shel Silverstein. Hmm? That's pretty cool. Right? Who is that? Shel Silverstein? You know, he wrote the, the children's poetry books that were really popular. Um, crap, I'm going to forget it. Where the Sidewalk Ends. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, great. He wrote a song. Well, a part, yeah, he wrote a song about Marie Laveau, like in part. It was he credited, he's credited on it. He didn't write it himself, but whatever. Um, I I think it's great that voodoo is essentially the idea that there's like a like a parallel world that's invisible, that's like right next to ours that we can kind of tap into at almost any time. Like there's a veil and it's kind of thin, and there's people who have access to it. I think that's awesome. Something that's not so awesome is Marie Laveau owned slaves. Yes. People, that's, I did hear that. That's not, and you know, I tried to look through, like she did, you know, buy a lot of people's freedom. She did a lot of great things in the community, but like the reality is, she like she just owned. She did own just own slaves. Do we know and, what she did with them? Like use them as slaves. Like Do I tried know? to find like positive versions of it. And, Maybe and she I was just she, chilling with them. I, I think Dave. I think if if it was that she treated them really well or treated them really horribly, I think there would have been some note of that, right? Maybe she's just treated them the way normal. everyone else. Treated yeah, them exactly. Yes, time. exactly. Yeah, exactly. So, um, I I think that there there is this woman, um, and I think you mentioned her in the Harlem Renaissance. I don't even know if you're gonna remember. Yes, you mentioned Zora Neale Hurston. Yes. So, I didn't know that she pulled this kind of Nellie Bly move where she kind of it, so it's a Nellie Bly move it's also like a Hunter S. Thompson move with the Hells Angels where she kind of butts herself into researching voodoo and hoodoo and kind of gets into this community and writes an awesome article about it I think that's really cool that kind of blows this whole thing up too which is really cool so um, what does she expose just the kind of stuff that we're talking about like the, burying like, chicken bones and and rum and the coins and the the skulls and just like all this cool stuff that you, you can think of like pouring some rum over like like a hot spoon i'm talking about like not meth or anything you know what i mean but like it's just like i i'm having a hard time articulating it but you know what i mean like a hair and a bow and like just you know uh, where did you bury this like underneath her rocking chair like that's that's voodoo so, to me so greg's version of voodoo is tying <laughs> your hair in a bow yeah, yeah pouring rum in a hot spoon that's right <laughs> <laughs> and then putting it under a rocking chair that's it dude you Greg's know that's voodoo. a spell dude you know you know that's a spell and you know what's funny is you can get books that are li that list sort of almost like a recipe book of like voodoo curses and spells and things that you can use which i which i don't honestly i don't even know if i dabble with that sort of thing oh boy i i just don't you know, know if i, I do. just am you know i just ordered that on amazon I, I know, listen I, I was gonna say if you could find if, if you could find one dave that was like kind of like strung together or bound in this like beautiful like old leather I, you would that would be a perfect christmas gift for you old leather skin oh yeah it's like made out yeah no it's made out of like badger skin from the bayou or what you know what I mean? it's like alligator from skin the, like, from the bayou that's right oh you're gonna try to do a luciana voice because I, <laughs> I think <laughs> i thought about maybe trying it because i know that there's like this this thing going on with um who's that handsome fellow magic mike channing tatum yeah he, oh he did the gambit the yeah. gambit uh accent is <laughs> illegible yeah yeah no and that was that sort of it's I don't know. Some, I, it sounds like he's doing like a, you know, some kind of 
uh, version of that, I think. It sounds like he's doing like the like a, a French something. The, yeah, the lightning bug from like, um, you know, that movie with the Disney princess. You know what I'm talking about? The frog princess or the princess. Yeah, I never saw that one, actually. But oh, that's... it's actually awesome. There is like there's the skulls with the top hat and all that stuff. Yeah cool I'm, stuff I, I actually want to watch it because they just uh opened up they turned uh splash mountain into tiana's bayou from that movie ah, so tiana's great character too and the the little they turned the frogs together very cool a very cool little thing and now we're talking about um pop Some culture pop a little culture. bit and i'm gonna i'm gonna mention something and you probably still haven't years later yes i did we, you watched skeleton key yes i did can we can we get a review uh, this is i enjoyed a- it i enjoyed it and I watched, I'm glad I didn't watch it before because like I said, I didn't always care for voodoo stuff. But over the last few years, I've actually like really kind of gotten into it. And yeah, I enjoyed it. I thought it was solid. And I think it's super underrated and people never know what it is. And Kate Hudson is awesome. That Peter Sarsgaard is great. This like the the cat, the, the woman that plays the grandmother, the whole thing is just really yeah. well done. And, it, and there's this underlying... You know, the story is fantastic, I think, and it's all based on like you know voodoo or yeah. hoodoo, but and I mean, slaves and yeah. yeah, it's got a little bit of everything. It's very got a very down uh, southern Louisiana feel. It and does. That's what I think I like the best about it. Yeah, I like the the how there's like the music too, like the old like slave yes. hymns, yeah, yeah. and like you know you're kind of like. Okay, that's it's just really yeah, kind of you know what I, I think that that's what makes that movie feel like oh all right I'm watching something that's kind of like set in this you know yeah um have you been to Louisiana have you been oh to yeah. New Orleans? yeah okay yeah yeah, yeah. so um, I, you know you know a name we didn't bring up which is like a rather big name and all this stuff um and it probably came up when you were searching for this was that was I was that Madame La 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 yeah, we didn't bring her up at all. Um, so that's a big name that we're kind of. Well, we did talk about her in the Hoodoo episode. Oh, okay, we did. So if people want to yeah. jump into the Hoodoo episode, which now is... it's her house. I always thought it was um, Madame Laveau, but it was it was her house, La Lurie, mm-hmm. that Nicolas Cage lived in for a period of time. Yeah, now that's one of the more horrific, horrific stories that you can listen to when they came into the attic and they found you know her husband was some kind of surgeon and they were they were mistreating their slaves so horribly that they were like kind of they when the when they opened the door to that upstairs room where they kept all these people they found like people inside out they felt people being slowly eaten by insects with honey all over them they found people whose limbs had been broken reattached so that they almost had to like walk like a crab just like horrific scenes and nicholas uh, cage said that's where i want to live and nicholas cage is like oh <laughs> and they're selling <laughs> beautiful so he does not live there now i actually did you go by that house when you were there oh yeah it's an incredibly beautiful house yeah, it, i went by it it's nice yeah i, I love that like architecture that mm-hmm. in the courtyard in the in the middle yep. like oh, it's just new orleans got a really cool feel to it in general um i was actually kind of hoping to get back there this year but it's not going to happen um, they also supposedly have one of the biggest like Halloween parades mm. um, crew crew K R E W E uh, festival or something like that crew parade um, sounds like it would be a blast, but I don't think. That's yeah. Gonna now, did you ever see that show Treme? Uh, no, I didn't. It was actually pretty good. It definitely they did a really good job with the New Orleans feel. It's just the show didn't really go anywhere after a bunch of yeah. seasons, but um, no, I love that whole vibe. I love. I love architecture. That's why Chicago, ironically, you mentioned, it's a great city too, Providence even, but like that old architecture just- You can't beat it. It's got, it's so unique and it's- Character, yeah. Very specific to New Orleans. One of my favorite moments when I was there was um, just this really like small thing, but I thought it was cool. Um, So I went to a restaurant and when I got it, when I was going in, they actually had a marker on the, on the restaurant as you were walking in that showed you the water level of how high Katrina got. Mm. And it was like, like not that it was like a good moment or anything like that, but it was like impactful to see that and just be like, able to take a step back and be like, wow, that was devastating. And then mm-hmm. the fact that this business was able to kind of like um, reemerge and come back from that. Like, I think that says a lot about the people of, of new Orleans. 
uh, their bi- ability to rebound. And I know, it, like, obviously, so much didn't. There's still large parts of it that, but from what I also understand, you know, pov- with poverty and levels and things like that, I mean, there was always a, a part of New Orleans that is kind of like desolate and abandoned and um, really impoverished too. So I mean, okay, it's got it's, up into it's, parishes. I think that like it's very unique. It's a unique it's place, a very unique place. But I do think that there's a strength to those people as well. Um, Absolutely, in New Orleans and, and the, the pride. Yeah. There's a, a, a pride to those to the people that live up New Orleans. Like really, I mean. Those the Mardi Gras parades, the people, the elaborate costumes they sew together. Yeah. I mean, it's just I know that it's so cool. I know. The um, thing. We'd be really remiss not to mention this pop culture reference: um, the American Horror Stories Covenant mm-hmm. season, which featured all these people. Like, um, I think I'm pretty sure Madame uh, Laveau was Marie yeah, Laveau was Bassett. there. Yes, and she's even a hairdresser in the show, I believe, mm-hmm. and she like does these little. But then I think uh, Madame. La Lurie was in there, um, but it really it did capture a little bit of what we're talking about here. Um, and obviously, with every American horror story, it goes off in a lot of different directions yeah. as well, and yeah. captured a bunch of different types of witches. But they did have elements of this in there, which I thought was pretty cool. That was actually Great. one of the better seasons. In- yeah, I, I think like after what was that? Maybe that's like maybe season three or something like that. Uh, maybe it's that one and the next one, and then it goes off the rails. I like Once the he- carnival one. That was the circus one. Then after that, it goes off the rails, I think. Um, yes. One thing I will say, I just to kind of get back to like kind of the core of this or like what voodoo is really about. Sure. So one of the core aspects of New Orleans voodoo is its focus on healing and community. So the voodoo rituals and the ceremonies often are aim, aimed to address physical, emotional, and spiritual ailments, offering support and guidance to those in need. Um, and the religions itself, he um, emphasizes the importance of maintaining balance and harmony both within oneself and within the community. So it's a very community-based thing, which makes total sense because of like it's not just its origins, but also like what it went through as it started to transform. Thinking about slavery, this idea of like sticking together in community mm-hmm. as you're, you know, uh, being part of the slave trade and all that stuff it makes a lot of sense and it it really is unfortunate that um it's good and bad that it got you know the the public uh view that it got the mm. public view all allowed it to be something that like new orleans was able to cash in on tourist reason like why and sure. brought yeah. brought a level of income into new orleans which is great for new orleans um but at the same time it kind of isn't necessarily fair to the people who practice voodoo that they're now looked at like witches. Um, right. You know what I mean? Yeah, so, no, but I, I think like you saying that word balance and like even from a mental health point of view, like I, I can't think of a more stoic sort of beautiful way like to, I mean, an aspiration balance. You know what I mean? Like you don't want to lean, you don't want to go shoot too much for pleasure. You don't want to be in the world of pain, but just like finding balance in everything you do. Being a balanced person, like like what does that even mean? It's like not letting your emotions, you know, drive your your behavior, kind of like really kind of just being centered and balanced. And that's like, I really, I really love that whole idea. Like control, like- the, the too, that. right? Like you, yeah. I know we that haven't really too. talked about that yet, but like that's all about like harmony and balance. Absolutely. So that's, um, and we'll talk about that at some point, but- it is funny how like it's that's I eerily similar to like the Eastern you know philosophies you know yeah yeah and so I... so and and just the last thing to say about this the biggest uh, difference between this and hoodoo from what I understand right now from this just that last conversation we were just having so voodoo is focused more on um, like we said healing and community. Mm-hmm. And hoodoo, which we previously had discussed in another episode, is more focused on protection, it seems like. Right. Right. So those That's would be the, the differences between the two from my understanding. My And also hoodoo, like it is really based on what you believe is is reality. And that's that's sort of like not something we can really get into at the end of an episode, but like like what the things that what you feel is true is going to, you know, that's going to be your reality. So you have to sort of believe in hoodoo for it to have any impact on you. And if you let any um, 
sort of kernel of doubt or possibility in, then you've kind of made yourself vulnerable to its powers. Like, I think that's kind of an interesting element of it. Absolutely. I mean, the truth, the truth is a very sort of, um, I mean, we think it's just this objective thing, but it isn't really. One person's truth is completely different than, than another's. And, and sort of playing with that is the idea of hoodoo. It's kind of like a heady, more sort of intellectualized I, version of voodoo, I think. Yeah. So like in the shadows a little bit more, you know? Mm -hmm. It feels like a little bit more like hidden. Maybe yeah. that's what the H stands for. <laughs> so I think that wraps up our episode on... Marie Laveau and New Orleans Voodoo. So yeah. one last thing before we uh, wrap this episode up is we got some fan mail. And um, I like this fan mail because I think this person was actively listening to an episode as they decided to write the fan mail, which makes it even uh, more special <laughs> because we're like mid listen, getting the thoughts of this person, which is cool to hear. Um, so they said, Hey, I'm listening to an episode on parapsychology. Uh, have you ever thought of telepathy as empathy? They said, I am an empath, an empath, sorry, and I can feel others' emotions, even complete strangers. It is overwhelming at times. No, I can't read their thoughts, but I can imagine what they might be thinking based on the feelings I get from them. It's not mm -hmm. magic. Uh, plenty of others can do what I, what I do, and it is something that I believe can be taught and learned to a certain extent. Do you think empaths could be considered telepathic? I do have some sort of a spiritual co connection with a higher self, a collective conscious, if you will. It's not something I was taught, but something felt from a very young age. Later, I learned about Jungian uh, psychology. He's a legit uh, psychologist, not just a philosopher. I would recommend you read some of his work if interested in collective con unconscious. Um, additionally, I recommend The Golden present uh, by Swami uh, Satchidanada, who founded Integral Yoga as a spiritual community and practice in Yogaville, Virginia. He was popular amongst hippies and, lar and led a um, large crowd of meditations at Lollapalooza, which that's cool. That uh, cool. Some, some of his uh, followers were super high, free, love hippies that followed his path and became Swamis themselves. And Swamis are basically vegetarian monks or priests that wear all orange to represent light. Uh, I enjoyed the episode on Charles Manson. I'm still in the middle of parapsychology, but I felt an irresistible urge to text you before even finishing the episode. Happy podcasting, dudes. I love this. This is uh, from somebody listening in Salisbury, North Carolina. Yeah, no, and hopefully they go through a catalog and run into the Carl Jung episode. I was so, just yes. going to say, yeah, they must yeah. not have gotten there yet because we definitely had have discussed him and we've referenced him a number of times. Um, but absolutely, he is he is definitely Heavy a psychologist and mm -hmm. he's got a ton of great thoughts and mm -hmm. things to share. Um, but, you know, there's a lot to unpack in this um, message. Uh, the thing I definitely... And with this person, when they're talking about that ability that they get um, to almost be able to envision someone's thoughts based well, on the, the emotions they're getting, I think that's... Yeah, but you could see well, how that could be dangerous. <laughs> right? Well, well, you're you're going to... So if I'm a straight CBT guy, cognitive yeah, behavioral that's therapy... Yeah, that's what I was... I was going CBT a little bit there. And I'm, and I'm going to go ahead and uh, talk about those cognitive distortions. We should do an episode just on cognitive distortions. You know what? Mm -hmm. Maybe we should do that next. Um well, the cognitive distortion that, that I would be doing would be um, mind reading. I was going to say, yeah. Which, yeah. yeah, which, you know, could potentially lead to some problems. Mm -hmm. um, but I think what this person is saying, and I, I know I it's an emotion. You can feel it. I emotion. appreciate the thought there. They're sensing an emotion, which is drawing them some conclusions to those thoughts. It's not thoughts reflected about them, yeah. which cognitive distortions are typically thoughts that we're having about like, Oh, that person is looking at me this way. That means they hate me. No, this, and I, I think I think it's isn't saying that. No, I think it's like a, sort of a beautiful sentiment too, because it's like understanding. That's like really kind of being open. And I, I, I'm, I'm getting. Like imagine if all people did this. Like you know, um, like the the guy who's in front of me at the um, the grocery store the other day, just kind of like, or no, he's like he has his door wide open, and I'm trying to pull in, and I can't pull in because he's. You know, whatever if he could feel that like if he could right. 
understand that like you know i'm getting something from you because my presence is making you feel a certain emotion and i'm kind of like feeling that and i don't know what you're thinking but i know i'm making you feel a certain way good or bad and like me now i have to adjust uh, like it's a really great communication tool right yeah. because i think there is something there where we can sort of feel each other's emotions i think that's clear right i i think this is way more telepathic than actual mm. telepathy absolutely I that i believe <laughs> and, um, well i would yeah. have to talk to someone who claims they are telepathic and see if they can read my thoughts and then I would say, please don't ever do that again. Yeah, no, please don't. I don't want to. <laughs> I feel to disgusting already. <laughs> it's true. Yeah, you don't want to be in there. Um, <laughs> and and thank you so much for that uh, individual who sent us that fan mail um, and shared those thoughts. That was actually really thought provoking. And when they initially sent that, I was like, wow, I um, hadn't really considered that. So that was cool to hear. And I also appreciate those recommendations that they offered. So. And one more thing, like I have a, I have someone who I don't really know too well who I work with and a different um, facet. And they said, love the definition. I love dark hippie and I love dark Forrest Gump. And I was, I could not even think of, like it took me forever. Hours later, I'm thinking, oh, they listened to Charles Manson. Because I, I didn't put it together for a long time. I was like, what you know what i mean so now i kind of like yeah, I, got you, that. I remember that you saying dark forest gump i don't remember you saying dark hippie i mean maybe you said dark hippie doubt it well he's a dark hippie sounds like something you would say well five two all five two of them you just said that like seductively though so that was weird <laughs> I didn't know where that was going. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, this was a fun episode for us. Uh, so yeah. hopefully you enjoyed this. I also, this that fan mail really got me thinking. If um if we were to gather enough questions, I would love to do just a question and a question and response. I'm not gonna say question and answer because I don't know that we have any answers. But that's a, question, a great thing. It's a great a, point. Yeah, a question and response episode. So if people want to send any questions or just give feedback. Um, you know, utilize the fan mail option on the podcast. You can comment on our YouTube episodes, which you now can watch us actively talking mm -hmm. on YouTube. Uh, we have full video up now. And also you could message us on any of the social medias. We're now on TikTok. That's amazing. Yeah, I'm going to have to talk to you about really, that. I guess Greg's not really that excited about it. I am excited about it. I am i don't know the logistics. Of I think it, it was his idea, um, but he doesn't even know how to use it. So, <laughs> Or you can email us, utgnpodcast at gmail.com. Um, any of those would be fine. But most importantly, the thing that we are begging, 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 um, and a lot of you are doing it because Spotify, we have a ton of ratings on there. Um, but if you are able to, and you can do so on Apple, that would be so appreciated because uh, you can leave a rating and a review and we would love to get the reviews um, just because it helps with the algorithms and getting the podcast shared more on there, on their platform, I guess. Um, so if able to do so, greatly appreciated. Otherwise, we will see you next week. Have a wonderful, wonderful day. Be the best version of you. Mm. Don't ever change. And stay cool forever. See you, ne see you next summer. <laughs> That's the yearbook signing. In the right. I like that. Bye. I like that. Good night. <laughs> <laughs>